I uh, draw on the previous talk um, given by Dr. Blöser on Kant's conception of freedom, and my talk will deal with this discussion on his theory of freedom um, immediately after his second critique appeared in 1788. While much research has been done in the field of Kant's theoretical philosophy, more and more attention has recently been paid to the historical context and impact of Kant's practical philosophy. Paul Geyer has emphasized that, quote, there's ample space for further research with regard to the roots and reception of Kant's philosophy, especially his moral philosophy, end of quote. And Dieter Henrich has stated that, quote, we are in need of a comprehensive study of the context of Kant's conception of freedom, end of quote. The figures surrounding the reception of Kant's practical philosophy are not only necessary to an understanding of the historical context of Kant's practical philosophy, rather these figures are also instrumental to an understanding of the development of Kant's theory of free will. But Kant's theory of freedom is not merely of interest to Kant scholarship as such. Concepts such as determinism, indeterminism, indifferentism, or compatibilism were introduced in this debate and employed in a way that is quite similar to the contemporary debate. My talk deals with a range of central yet lesser known philosophical contributions dealing with Kant's theory of freedom and situates them within the historical and systematic context of their time. These texts document the intense controversy that arose in the immediate context of Kant's critical philosophy following the publication of his Critique of Practical Reason in 1788. In my talk, I want to present and analyze important contributions to this debate, beginning with the early reception of his moral philosophy by Johann Heinrich August Ulrich, not very well known, um, in his book Eleutheriology, German Eleutheriologie, or on freedom and necessity, and ending with Schelling's philosophical investigations into the essence of human freedom from 1809. I will argue, however, that the post-Kantian debate is not so much concerned with the problem of how to reconcile freedom with the laws of nature, but rather with the problem of intelligible fatalism, according to which we are only free to act morally, but not to, free to act to free immorally. I show how philosophers such as Karl Leonhard Reinhold, Johann Gottlieb Fichte and finally Friedrich Wilhelm Josef Schelling attempted to respond to the challenge of such an intelligible fatalism. Finally, I show how these conceptions of freedom are related to the contemporary debate by referring to a Christine Korsgaard's a theory of action and to Harry Frankfurt's um, conception of um, freedom of the will. Let's start with um, Kant on freedom as rational determinism. So here in this part, I will draw on the previous talk. And I mentioned this quotation again. This is the, a, a quote that Kant gave in his religion on imputability. He says, the human being must make or have made himself into whatever he is or should become in a moral sense, good or evil. These two characters must be an effect of his free power of choice for otherwise they could not be imputed to him and consequently he could not be neither morally good nor evil. So we must have the choice to act either in a morally good or evil way. Um, so the, the main question of Kant's second critique is um, how a reason, practical reason, can determine the will um, and without any influences by sensibility, which would be, according to Kant, hetero heteronomy. So he, he's, he's arguing and he's asking the question, quote, whether pure reason of itself alone suffices to determine the will or whether it can be a determining ground of the will only as empirically conditioned. So here's the question about rational um, self-determination or rational determin determination of the will. So reason is very important in order to um, be free. And here's the situation of the will, according to Kant's picture. He says, quote, the will stands between its a priori principle, which is formal and also rational, 
and it's a, po a posteriori incentive which is material as at a crossroads. So this is a very critical position of the human will according to Kant. So now the question is how can pure practical reason motivate and determine the human will so that it acts morally good. In order to be free, in order to um, be called free, the will must be in a way determined. So it's not enough to be independent from empirical influences. There need to be a special kind of determina determination. So he says in this quotation, quote, freedom is not lawless, but must instead be a causality in accordance with immutable laws, but of a special kind, for otherwise a free will would be an absurdity. So what kinds of law is Kant talking about here? I mean, everyone knows it. This is the moral law, not just special laws, but a very, very special law uh, by the moral law. Um, and will, according to Kant, is a kind of causality of living beings in so far as they are rational, and freedom would be that property of such causality that it can be efficient independently of alien causes determining it. So we have here two conceptions of freedom, positive freedom and negative freedom. The positive aspect is this kind of rational causality, the will being determined by pure practical reason or the moral law. This is positive freedom. So here is um, the reciprocity thesis that um, the previous talk referred to. I'm quoting it again. He says, a free will and a will under moral laws are one and the same. So this is a um, uh, statement about identity. Um, so if the will is free, then it is under the moral law and the other way around, it's the same. So if the will is under the moral law, the will is free. So we have this um, sort of identity between both, kind, both kinds of will. Um, and there's another quotation um, that is called um, the Reciprocity Thesis by Hel Henry Ellison in, 18, in 1986. He says, quote, freedom and unconditional practical law reciprocally imply each other. Uh, the German translation, however, is a little bit weaker. There is, it's written, weisen wechselweise aufeinander zurück. So they are uh, referring to each other um, in, in, in a double way. And so this translation of imply seems to me to be a little bit too strong because implication would be a logical sense. And it's not clear whether Kant thought it, it's, a, it's an implication in a, um, a B-conditional in, in, in a logical way. At least we can put it in this way, a very general way. The deeply connected, so here's the question whether, it, whether it's, it's an identity. So, uh, as I said, Henry Ellison has called this the reciprocity thesis. Um, here's the problem. From this reciprocity thesis follows a really big problem, namely the problem of moral imputability and also intelligible fatalism. So this is the argument that one could um, construe. So on the one hand, first premise, um, freedom is the rational determination of the will by the moral law. The moral law commands morality. It follows that we are only free in acting morally and we are bound in acting evilly, namely by external obstacles of reason, something that is external from reason, that it has nothing to do with ourselves. So that would be a kind of heteronomy in this kind, in, in this way, if we act evilly. Henry Sejic was one of the first um, interpreters, modern interpreters, uh, who um, emphasized this problem. He said, um, quote, Kant either expressly or by implication identifies will and reason. For this identification obviously excludes the possibility of wills choosing between reason and non-rational impu impulses. Um, but or already before, Karl Leonhard Reinhold, who I will discuss in this talk, he um, pointed to the same problem. So Henry Ellison called this problem Reinhold's dilemma. So that's one way of um, describing it. Another uh, description of this problem is objection RS. R means Reinhold, S means Sejic. This is a really, really a big problem of Kant. 
So the question is, how can we act freely if our will is necessitated by the moral law? Isn't the determination of the will by the moral law, by pure practical reason, a kind of necessitation? So how can we be free in being determined or being, even being necessitated by the moral law? Kant would, of course, say that that is the very kind of freedom we need, being necessitated by from from inner from an inner principle, namely pure practical reason. He would say that that's autonomy, that's the freedom we need. But here the question is: Is freedom of the will compatible with this kind of necessitation, even if it's pure practical reason? So the first philosopher who um, discussed this problem and who is not very well known is um, Johann August Heinrich Ulrich, um, and he wrote a book. I mentioned it. It was called. Eleutheriology from 1788, and I would like to classify his position as a kind of transcendental incompatibilism because he was discussing Kant's theory and uh, also classifying it. So he says in this quotation, quote, it is clear that Kant's doctrine must in no way be confused with indeterminism, for with respect to appearances and the actions concerning the empirical character of man, from which perspective the indeterminist tends to regard him, Kant teaches the most decisive necessity and denies all freedom. With respect to the intelligible character, however, he knew to explain himself in such an ingenious way that from one side he avoids natural necessity, according to precisely the concept he determined, and from the other side he avoids chance, i.e. an arising without any determinative grounds. But since the denial of natural necessity in the Kantian sense precludes only determination by appearances or by temporally preceding conditions, the question always remains whether grounds of the determination of the intelligible faculty are to be found in the intelligible character itself, which would not be temporally prior, but would nevertheless be grounds. In this case, there would be natural necessity understood in another way. So this is the first interpretation of the Kantian conception of autonomy in a, in a way of necessity. There's another quotation. Um, I quote it, quote, perhaps the omission of reason is an original and immutable lack of reason's activity, a weakness in the intelligible character. And perhaps the exercise of reason is an original and notabene immutable state of a higher activity and efficiency. Then we have necessity with the immutability of the intelligible character, also not natural necessity in the Kantian sense. But the empirical character is necessarily grounded in the intelligible character. Thus here too is necessity, thus everywhere necessity. So this is kind of a dilemma appointed to by Ulrich. So if uh, the laws of nature determine our will in a way that it is necessitated, then we would need to say that the termination of the will by the moral law is also a kind of necessity. So how can we be free if we are necessitated both by the laws of nature and by the law of reason? So isn't that a problem? So he asked this question. So there was another philosopher at the time called Johann Heinrich Abicht, and in his um, work a year later that appeared in 1789, he tried to um, argue against Ulrich's um, conclusion that we are necessitated by the moral law and so unfree. He interpreted uh, the determination of the will by the moral law in, an, in a different sense that was closer to Kant's. He said, quote, freedom is supposed to be moral or inner necessity, inner constraint. If this is the case, then it is the same whether we assume inner or outer necessity, for in both cases the concept of freedom is lost. Not at all. This is just a misunderstanding, for inner necessity means the determined being of the thing, its intrinsically determined activity itself. So he is closer to the Kantian notion of the autonomy of will. But this is, so to speak, the framework within which the whole debate on freedom and determinism takes place after Kant. It's more concerned with um, the determination of the will by the moral law and not so much by the laws of nature. Here's the third person I want to discuss in this historical debate. His name was Karl Christian Erhard Schmidt, and he 
uh, proposed a theory that he himself called intelligible fatalism. So this deals with the question of how to understand the will being determined by the moral law. Here's a quotation. He said, when in, in so far actions bear the imprint of rational self-activity, or when a given substance is determined and treated according to the form of reason, then they are moral actions. Immoral, by contrast, in so far as there is no trace of an effect of self-active reason. So this is a kind of uh, privation theory of evil. So acting in a morally evil way means that there's a kind of a lack of uh, determination by uh, practical reason. So the question is, what else determined out us um, to act in a morally evil way? That's the question. What was the instance? It must have been something external to us, not, not something internal. Um, so here is uh, the privation theory of evil. He says, quote, immoral actions and attitudes by no means depend on the own absolute self-activity, but rather on the privation of it. It's a privation theory of evil. It says also another quote, the capacity to act immorally is a consequence of the restriction of our freedom that is, with regard to reason, of its incapacity. So acting more in a morally evil way means to be incapable of acting in a morally way, moral way. Is thus acting in, a, in an immoral way means that we exercise an incapacity or that, how to understand this? This is a little bit strange, hard to understand. Another quotation in this concept is, quote, man, once he acts immorally, is never entirely in his senses. That is, he does not have the capacity of moral freedom. And the last quotation by Karl Christian Erhard Schmidt in his Versuch einer Moralphilosophie, attempt at a moral philosophy, quote, we have no freedom, no original inner determining ground to want evil, but are in this respect merely dependent. So this is the problem. According to Schmidt, we are only free to act in a morally good way, but we are bound if we act in a morally evil way. So how can we be blamed of having acted in a morally evil way. That's, that's the problem. So Karl Leonhard Reinhold, um, he's a little bit more famous, but not so well known um, nowadays. He tried to argue against this kind of intelligible fatalism held by or proposed by Karl Christian Erhard Schmidt in this debate. I will call his position a kind of rational indifferentism. That might be a contradiction, but it seems to me to be the best label to understand his position in this debate. So he argued against Schmidt, against his conception of intelligible fatalism, and he said, quote, his, that is Schmidt's, claim that man acts only freely in the case of morally good but not in morally evil actions, and that he is inevitably determined to the latter, incenses me to the highest degree. Nevertheless, I must ad admire the subtlety that he employed. His proton pseudos is the Kantian concept of the will as a causality of reason, from which certainly follows that if morality is the activity of reason, immorality couldn't be the activity of reason, and since only reason's activity shall be free, couldn't be free. So he's trying to find arguments against this position by Karl Christian Erhard Schmidt and tries to avoid this dilemma of uh, either heteronomy being determined by the law of nature, or intelligible fatalism being determined by the law of reason, the moral law. So, and here's the answer, his strategy to um, avoid this dilemma. He's arguing, he says, quote, the effect of reason can never contradict reason. By the action of a person by reason can since the latter is not founded in the definite procedure of reason, but in the capacity to determine one's action on one's own and to deliberately make use of reason. So it depends on the way we use our capacity of reason. So how will and reason are connected in a special way. And also important is that he conceives of the subject of freedom, not, not in terms of pure practical reason, as Kant sometimes seemed to do, 
but in terms of the person, the individual person that can use or actualize her capacities such as reason or the will. And here's another very, very important quotation in this context. He says, quote, willing is more than mere involuntary desire and that in each condition of mind, in willing there exists a special action that is called decision and which by reflection on it is distinguished from the claim of involuntary desire. So I interpret this passage in terms of what Harry Frankfurt has later called first order desires and second order volitions. So what he calls here involuntary desire is the basis of our inclinations or desires, first order desires. And we need to reflect upon them by reflection and um, involving reason and other capacities and forming our will by dealing with this f first order desires. We need to have some reflection involved. So this is the way he tries to avoid um, intelligible fatalism. Another quotation, and here's, here's the question finally, so what is the reason for our action um, if it's not the law of nature and also not the law, the moral law? And here's a quotation that led me to the classification, the labeling of his position as a rational indifferentism. So he says, quote, a free action is groundless in so far as its ground and reason is freedom itself. But this is also the last thinkable reason of that action. It is the absolute, the first course of its action. Over and above, one cannot think further, since it really depends on nothing else. To ask, why did the free will determine itself in this or that way means to ask, why is it free? Supposing it needed a reason distinct from it means to deny its freedom. So I wouldn't say that it, that's a kind of irrationalism because he says there are reasons involved. But finally, he would say that we cannot give an objective reason. He would say it's just a subjective reason. So the question is whether this distinction between objective reasons and subjective reasons um, is plausible. I doubt it. I would say that this distinction is highly problematic because there are always reasons involved. But he would say uh, at the end we cannot uh, give an objective account of the reasons that led us to act in this or that way. So that's the reason why I call his position a rational indifferentism, kind of rational indifferentism. Let's proceed to the next thinker, Johann Gottlieb Fichte. He's, I think, relatively well-known compared to Karl Leonhard Reinhold or even uh, August Heinrich Ulrich or Karl Christian Erhard Schmidt. Um, but I would say that we can only understand Fichte's contribution or Fichte's theory of freedom if we situate him within this context, within this debate on freedom that began shortly after Kant's second critique appeared in 1788. Because Fichte is explicitly referring to this debate, especially to Karl Leonhard Reinhold. So he said in this quotation, quote, as many supporters of the critical philosophy have maintained and has been shown in an illuminating manner by Reinhold, one must carefully distinguish between those manifestations of absolute self-activity, self-statigkeit, by means of which reason is practical and assigns a law to itself, and those other manifestations through which a person in this function of his will determines his, himself to obey or not to obey this law. This is a very, very crucial distinction that we also find in Christian Korsgaard's interpretation of um, Kant's uh, moral philosophy. I will quote a, a passage uh, soon. So here's, here's a, a very um, obvious reference to, to Reinhold. Um, and so these are the, um, some of he, uh, Fichte's tasks. I won't explain all these tasks. That would take too much time, but just a very brief Manner. First, he says that the morally responsible person must be conceived as a unified, both rational and sensible individual. So this, he stresses the individuality of a person, and this is against Kant's conception of pure practical reason, which sometimes seemed to be the subject of moral freedom, according to Kant. And he stresses the unity of this individual 
This is a very important point. The second task by Fichte is that the free will must be distinguished from the general capacity of pure practical reason in order to avoid, avoid the danger of intelligible fatalism and to develop a conception of individual self-determination, like Rein Reinhold did in his um, theory of first-order desires and second-order volitions. I think that has to do with, with um, the problem of individuality. What is the subject, the individual, that is to be called free? Third, a specific form of rationality and reflexivity of the will must be preserved and analyzed in order to avoid the danger of, of indifferentism or empirical determinism. So that would be uh, the other lemma. So the one lemma is rational determinism or even empirical determinism. That means necessity, according to Fichte. And the other lemma is pure chance or indifferentism. That would also not suffice to understand our being free. Fourth, acting morally must be understood as something that is imputable in the light of the moral law. So we always need to justify our actions with regard to the demand of the moral law. So that means, as Kant already said, we need to subordinate our will, our maxims under uh, the moral law, or sub even subordinate the moral law under our individual maxims, but there's always the moral law in involved in this action. There's always this rationality involved. So this is very similar to Kant's account in his religion, I think. And here's the crucial point that Fichte um, distinguishes, um, that Fichte um, makes here, I quote it, the mere form of willing this absolute demand for individual identity is not yet the moral law. The pure willing is here not used in that way like the moral law, but only for the explanation of the consciousness at all. Kant needs the categorical imperative only for the explanation of the consciousness of duty. So Fichte distinguishes um, between the pure I or pure ego and between the moral law. And the pure ego is not identical to pure practical reason, as it seemed to be uh, according to Kant's conception of the intelligible character. It seemed to be purely rational and even determined by the moral law. So here, this is a very crucial distinction. And this distinction is similar to what Christine Korska did in uh, her recent books from 1996 and 2009. He says that she, she says that Kant's theory seems to imply that only good action is really action and that there is nothing left for bad action to be. I'm going to make a distinction that Kant doesn't make. I'm going to call the law of action acting only on maxims, you can will to be the laws, the categorical imperative. And I'm going to distinguish it from what I will call the moral law. So the categorical imperative is something that, has, that needs to be distinguished from the moral law. And this helps her to explain both the individuality of the act actor and the possibility of acting in a morally bad way. That seems to be very similar to Fichte's account, the quote I gave before. So let's proceed to Friedrich, Friedrich Wilhelm Josef Schelling's rational vol voluntarism and real compatibilism, as I want to call it. Because Schelling also draws on, on Fichte's and especially on Reinhold's uh, account of freedom. So first, he there's an interesting passage from his um, um, essay on freedom, um, namely a um, distinction that helps him to uh, make, um, as I read him, a freedom of the will being compatible with our natural existence. He says, quote, dependence does not abolish independence, it does not even abolish freedom. Dependence does not de determine its being and says only that the dependent, whatever it may be, can be a consequence only of that of which it is a dependent. Dependence does not say that the dependent is or is not. And here's the very crucial point. Every organic individual exists as something that has become only through another and in this respect is depending according to its becoming, but by no means according to its being. So this seems to be a crucial distinction that helps Schelling to avoid um, this problem of 
um, necessity by the, the law of nature. So this is the attempt to unify, an attempt of a kind of compatibilism to um, make freedom of the will compatible with our individual natural existence. So this is what he calls organic dependence. To be distinguished from just um, processes or events um, determined by the laws of nature. And now Fichte um, develops an account of the will that can also interpret it according to Harry Frankfurt's distinction between first order desires and second order volitions. However, this quotation is really, really dark, but I interpret it in this sense. He says, in the final and highest judgment, there's no other being than will. Will is primal being, German Ursein, to which alone all predicates of being apply. Groundlessness, eternality, independence from time, self-affirmation. All of philosophy strives only to find this highest expression. So what I want to do is to argue against what Heidegger has called and others uh, Schelling's metaphysics of evil. I think that that is not very helpful to systematically understand his position. So I would say that we can interpret this quotation um, in, a, in a way that will has sort of, so to speak, two levels. So there is there are first order desires that are unconsciously given and there is the possibility of self-affirmation that would be a kind of reflexivity that we could call um, second order volitions like Reinhold did after Kant. And there is another uh, conception um, that helps Schelling to reconcile um, our demand of being determined in a way against mere indeterminism and to avoid intelligible fatalism in being just determined by the law of nature. And he called this conception higher necessity. He says, quote, higher necessity remains unknown, which is equidistant from contingency in determinism and from compulsion or external determination, which is rather an inner necessity springing from the essence of the acting individual itself. So necessity, inner necessity, must not be confused, according to Schelling, with what Kant called pure practical reason or the pure will, because this kind of will would not be individual, an individual, but just something that is generally structured by the demand of the moral law. And Schelling, um, against Kant, as I read him, stresses the individuality of the will, which is nonetheless in a very specially, spe special way determined. He calls it higher necessity. And that leads me to my final point, um, which is Harry Frankfurt's, which I call volitional necessitarism. And it's very, very interesting that Harry Frankfurt criticized Kant for the same reasons that Reinhold did immediately after his second critique. So Frankfurt says, quote, Kant argues that someone whose conduct is motivated merely by his own personal interests is inevitably heteronymous. What interests a person is a contingent matter, of course, which is determined by circumstances that are outside his control. Kant understands this to entail that personal interests are not integral to essential nature of a person's will. In his view, they are volitionally adventitious. They do not depend wholly upon the person's inherent volitional character, but at least partly upon causes that are logically external to it. So he criticizes uh, Kant's account for the same reasons that, in my opinion, um, Reinhold and Schelling did. Here's another critique of Kant's conception of the pure, purely determined will. Frankfurt says, quote, the pure will has no individuality whatsoever. It is identical in everyone and its volitions are everywhere exactly the same. In other words, the pure will is thoroughly impersonal. The commands that it issues are issued by no one in particular. Fichte tried to preserve this individuality that, in his opinion, Kant could not preserve, and Frankfurt, as I read him, tries exactly the same. And here's um, the solution by Harry Frankfurt that is 
again, very similar to what Schelling proposed. He says, quote, a person who is subject to volitional necessity finds that he must act as he does. For this reason, it may seem appropriate to regard situations which involve volitional necessity as providing instances of passivity. But the person in a situation of this kind generally does not construe the fact that he is subject to volitional necessity as entailing that he is passive at all. People are generally quite far away from considering that volitional necessity renders them helpless bystanders to their own behavior. Indeed, they may even tend to regard it as actually enhancing both their autonomy and their strength of will. So this kind of volitional necessity is, according to Harry Frankfurt, contingent. So it does not rule out our freedom uh, of the will. And so here is, in my opinion, um, a way out of this dilemma of intelligible fatalism or of a natural determinism, uh, namely a sort of contingent voli volitional necessity that is beyond indifferentism, intelligible fatalism, and empirical determinism. 